Okay, so let's start the class on Thursday. So the, the test one is on Thursday, right? And uh, it includes that uh, unit here. So that's why I want to finish today. And um, that's why I have posted new homework for this Friday. I did a mistake, you know, I it was, it's because I copy from the last semester. So sometimes the date gets messed up. So if you see something that is not right, you should email me as soon as possible. So you have homework for Friday that goes over the Gauss law. So what I did is that in the share folder, is that annoying or you can hear me well? Yeah. So in the share folder in Dropbox, I have tutorials. So I have video where I go step by step through every single problem that you find in the homework. Of course, you don't want to watch the video. You have to feel the pain and the misery. You have to pull out a few hair and then you can look at the solution. Okay. So I try to do that for a uh, Homework, you can see those videos are like 10 years old or something like this. So anyway, so the the test one is on Thursday during class time. It's in person, it's on paper. And um, I will print out for you the equation sheet that you find in Canvas. So you can get used to them. You can look through them. You will have the same equation sheet for the test. I have found the best equation sheet ever, okay? I've been for the look for equation sheet for a long time. I think I found the, the right ones. So you cannot bring your own equation sheet. You need to bring a GI, of course, and not to be sick that day because makeup um, usually harder because I don't have the same amount of time for you. Yes. You are stretching or it's a question? Test one practice, uh, still due February 9th. Uh, why? Is that uh, after or before the test? When is the test? Like Thursday, February next. Okay, so next Thursday, right? You don't have the practice test, you don't have to do it. It doesn't count for the final grade, it's for you. So it doesn't matter. Next week, yeah, next week, Thursday. It was supposed to be Tuesday, but I move it to next week, Thursday, right? So the practice test, you don't have to do it. It doesn't count. It's just to help you out. Any more questions? Okay, so Gauss law. So um, Michael Faraday had this vision of electric field lines, okay? I, I have a video that I have uploaded in Canvas. It's helping you really visualize those field lines or lines of forces. And he's the one who envisioned them, but he didn't go to college, he didn't go to school, so he lacked the mathematical skills to translate this concept as a mathematical equation. So you have this equation here that was developed by Gauss later and James Maxwell. And this is not hard to understand. It just tells you that if you take an imaginary bag, imagine it's a bag or it's a closed area. They call that Gaussian surface just to scare up students, but it's not scary, it's just an imaginary bag. The number of lines poking through that bag only depends on the total amount of charges inside that bag divided by epsilon zero. Epsilon zero, you remember it's permittivity of vacuum, it's 8.85 times 10 to negative 12. So it's just a constant. So that means that all, if you count how many lines fog who, so if it's going out of the bag, it's going to be counted positively. If it go inside the bag, it's counted negatively. And those number of lines poking, poking through an imaginary bag equals the total of charge inside divided by epsilon zero. And we, we should uh, celebrate with champagne, but uh, they just got an email that you cannot have alcohol on campus. Uh, otherwise, that's your first Maxwell equation, right? So it's a big deal. So that's called Gauss's law. So it's um, 
the, the, so the number of lines, so in uh, mathematics, it's called the flux, right? So it's an important concept in physics, but also in mechanical uh, or, or mechanic of fluid as well. So it's very easy to understand. So if you have uh, in a pipe water flowing, it can flow very fast or very slow. And you have here an imaginary cross section, so imaginary area. The flux will be the amount of fluid, so the volume going through that area per unit second. So in that case, that will be the definition of flux, the amount of stuff going through that area per unit second. And there was a very nice video that I have uploaded in the module two, right, in, in Canvas. So it's easy to find the volume. Volume is always area times the height here. So as it goes through, so it's going to be the area times that displacement here, but that displacement is just the velocity times the time. Okay, so that will be the volume of water going through here. So that means the volume per unit second will be, you divide by the time, it's just the area times V. And that will be true for any flux. It's always the area times the vector involved. So here we have velocity. And we discussed that last time. It makes sense. If it's flowing faster, you're going to have more stuff going through. If the area is bigger, you also have more stuff going through. You can also divide, uh, define the flux for light, for example, you can say that will be the amount of light, the amount of energy going through that imaginary area. Okay, so that will be the flux for light per unit time. So when we come to electric field lines, same idea. You see that could be you can think of the flux, so the electric field flux as the number of lines going through that area. It's just to understand. Of course, you don't really have such a thing as field of lines. Okay, just a way to uh, visualize what's going on. You see that flux depends on how strong the field is. Because you remember how strong is the magnitude of the field? If the field is very strong, we're going to draw packed lines, right? When the lines are very packed, that means the magnitude of the electric field is larger. So you're going to catch them, uh, catch uh, more, more of them. Of course, it also depends on the orientation of the area, right? So here you have more than here. And that's why we need to define the way to uh, characterize the orientation of the area. So we define a small unit vector, which is perpendicular to the area. So it's a unit ve vector, so we can say this is A, A hat, right? So for example here, so I'm just reviewing what we did last time, but I think it's important. So here you have an imaginary area, so you can, uh, trace a small unit vector n hat that's going to tell you, that give you the orientation of that area relative to the field line. So if, if the area is now like this, and you have n hat here, because it's always perpendicular, and you have the field line, you know, Imagine it's flowing in this direction, then of course the flux equals zero. Is that clear? We discussed that last time. So you see that the flux, which is the number of lines poking through that area, okay, depends on how strong the magnetic field is, because in that case, if it's very strong, you're gonna have more lines. Of course, it's gonna also depends on the area. So if you have a larger area, you can catch more of them. You have more electric field going through. But it also depends on the angle 
between that small unit vector and E. Okay, and you see when the angle is pi over 2, the flux equals 0. And each time you have orientation involved, then you're going to have a sine or a cosine. To get 0 when the angle is pi over 2, so we need to have a cosine here. Okay, so that will be cosine. And luckily, we have a mathematical tool to put that in equation. That will be the dot product, so E dot A. So that will be the case when the electric field is uniform, constant, right? Of course, if it's not constant, then you have to integrate, which you don't have to worry at that level, yes. Cosine. Because it's cosine, because I want to make sure that when the angle is 90 degrees, right, it's going to be zero. So I'm going to put a cosine. And then I remember that in math, when we have a vector A and a vector B, which is equal to the mag when you have magnitude of A times magnitude of B times the cosine between A and B. In math, we, we have that in our toolbox. We have the dot product. Is that clear? Yeah. It's, it's just you open your uh, math tool and say, okay, what do you have to offer for us? If we want to express that, and oh, good, we have the dot product. It looks good. It, it scares students away. Okay, is that clear? So in the, if you take calculus three, for example, I don't know what type of calculus you have to take, but you see, you, you can always, even if it's a complex area, you can divide in small area and you can define that little vector here, right? You need vector. Okay, no big deal here. <clears throat> okay, let's see here what you have. So first of all here, I have a charge, okay? And um, imagine you're gonna have an aura, which is called the electric field flowing out of that charge, we have seen that. And because of the symmetry, if you take an imaginary bag, so this is my imaginary bag, and I call that a Gaussian surface. So it's a bag, okay? It's close. It's like a hamster, ham, you know the things to torture, hamster, hamster, bubble, right? So you put your charge inside, and you see that those lines are going to poke through. First of all, line here will be perpendicular. Why it has to be perpendicular? Because think about it. If it was like this, you say, why nature will favor that angle versus this angle here? Okay, it it, Nature will not be able to decide. So it has to be perpendicular. At that distance here, so you see here the electric field start to be strong. It's stronger. The lines are closer to each other. And as you move away from the charge, it decreases as a distance square. We already knew that, yes? Okay, so can you for me apply Gauss law? So the flux, the flux equals Q in divided by epsilon zero. Okay? I already knew Q in. So what's going to be the flux? So the flux is flux is E dot A. Okay. So are they perpendicular, the surface and the electric field? Is it perpendicular? Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to say E times what is the area of a bag that is a sphere. First of all, it's an area, so you need to have R square somewhere. If it's a volume, you need to have R cube, so it's going to be what? Four, four pi R square, very good. 
equals Q in, so whatever you have inside here, epsilon zero. So what do I get? That the electric field at that distance here is the same, okay, the same magnitude, the same, I mean, it's along the radius. In magnitude, it's gonna be Q in four pi r square epsilon zero. But I already knew that from Coulomb's law. That means if you have a one Coulomb of charge here, it's gonna be acted upon by a force. Coulomb's law says that force is gonna be one uh, times Q in over four pi epsilon zero r square. So it's um, it's nice, I find the same thing, right? So conclusion, Gauss law is in fact the consequence of Coulomb's law. Remember that one over four pi epsilon zero is the same thing as uh, K, right? Which is nine times 10 to the nine. Is that clear? Are you with me? So it looks um, intimidating. You see, you see those calculus three or four, whatever, but actually it's not that hard. Okay, let's apply Gauss law here. We say that E, so the flux, the flux of E through that imaginary bag, okay, bubble, it's empty, equals Q in over epsilon zero. What's gonna be the flux? Zero, because you have as many lines poking in than you have line poking through. So that means the flux equals zero. That means, do we have any charge inside? No charge. If you do mechanical uh, mechanical fluid, for example, that means if you have a flow, it's a, um, how it's called, it's a linear flow, right? So that means inside here, you have no source, no source and no sink. It, it doesn't pop here and it doesn't sink. Okay, so let's try to do this one. So what about this one, do you think? So it, again, okay, that, that blue here, that blue uh, surface, it, it's imaginary. Okay, it doesn't exist, right? It's an imaginary uh, volume, empty volume, shell. So do you think there is something inside here? Yes, it must be what we call the source somewhere. If you take calculus, advanced calculus, they call that divergent, uh, blah, blah, right? So there is a source somewhere inside, okay? So let's, let's take to, uh, Let's let's try to find the electric field as a function of whatever is inside. Okay, so you see the electric field here is the same. It's a uh, uniform, per, per, uh, parallel to each other. Uh, they have the same. The electric field has the same density because it's evenly spaced and it's perpendicular. So how can I write that down? So that's gonna be E times A equals Q in over epsilon zero. So what about the flux here? And let's say we have that diameter to R. So what's gonna be the flux here? E times, what's the area? So 2R is the diameter. So the area is pi R square, very good. Okay, so that will take care of the number of lines poking through that side. What about here? We have the same thing. Is that clear? Q in over epsilon zero. So you combine like term, one banana plus one banana is two banana. 
equals q in over epsilon zero, you isolate e, so you see it's going to be q in over 2 pi r squared epsilon 0, whatever is inside here. Okay, so that just to give you an idea how we're going to use Gauss law. Is that clear? So in all the problems that you're going to do, the electric field poking through the area of interest is always uniform and perpendicular. Okay, don't have to worry about integration. Okay, so that's flux. So here, in that case, you see that the electric field going through that surface here is going to be E times the area times the cosine. Do you all understand? You can think of that as why do you need cosine? Because you see E has two components. One component along the area does not work through. So you have to eliminate that component here. And you have a component here along that here. So that's the one that you want to take in account. So that's why you have a cosine. Okay. So let's do um, an example. So here, for example, what's the flux through that area? Zero, very good. Okay. Here, the flux um, go here, you have to take the cosine times the area times E, and here is just E times the area. So that's from the book, so that's why I, I understand that textbooks are expensive, you don't have a scholarship, but you still need a textbook, like even an old edition, you can rent a check, and if you rent it a check, you also have the solution, by the way. But uh, you can rent it wherever you want. You can buy a very 20 years old edition and you have the solved problem. So anyway, that's from the book. And so try to answer the question. Um, yeah, so I don't know what the question. Do you have the magnitude here? What is electric flux through the disk? Okay, so the electric flux through the disk. So this one is easy. So the flux equals E dot A. And it's a uniform E, so I don't have to worry about integrating. Okay. And you see here that your normal, it's a hat, so it's a unit vector. It's just a way to keep track of the orientation of your area in space. So that's going to be, so do the computation. It's going to be E, A, the cosine between E and A. So what do you get? It's going to be 2 times 10 to the third times what is what is the area of a circle a square very good and we have a cosine 30. so the electric flux is cos mm -hmm. so what do you get Cosine 30, da, 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 that square root of three over 2 times 0 0.1 square times pi times 2,000. Huh? This is 4.1. This is 4.4. We have to be careful with the unit. So we have a Newton per coulomb times meter square. Is that clear? And then they tell you what if it uh, is perpendicular. So now we take the same area and we make it like this. Zero. Okay. And if it's parallel, if it's parallel, so n hat is parallel to E, 
So the flux is going to be just the area times A. So that cosine is always between 0 and 1. So when there is a, when it's, a, it's not parallel, it's going to be less than the maximum. So that's going to be uh, I found a 63 Newton meter square per coulomb. Okay, so that's from your book. And um, there is an extension 22.2. What's nice is that even though they have new edition, they keep the same solved problem. So that's good. Yeah. On this side, the maximum possible flux, that was good. So the, this side is answering this question. What is a flux through the disk if n hat is parallel to E? So that means if you take your surface here this way. So n hat is parallel to E. So then you have cosine uh, 0. Cosine 0 is 1. Right? So for example, here, if I want to find the flux, oh, that's the extension. The flux is through that imaginary cube. It's going to be zero, right? You have as much, as much going in that you have out, OK? So blah, 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 same thing. So this, we did that. We did that previously. So, of course, sometimes um, if you take, that's again an imaginary area, okay? It doesn't exist. You, you, you take your own. It's a Gaussian surface. Now, you see that in that case, the electric field is not going to be the same all over the area. So, in that case, you need to take the soap of E cosine delta A. Do you understand? So it means you take your area here, you divide the area in small, small, small pieces here. And for each little piece, you're going to find out that small area times E cosine. Okay, so how much field line goes through. And in, in the video, I show you it's, it's, it's like you are, uh, going through the whole area, right? So for each small area, you need to find how much of E is along N hat. So you have to do delta A times E times cosine theta. And you have to add all over the area, OK? So that, but you don't have to worry about that because all the examples that we're going to deal with E is always uh, uniform. Yeah, you don't have, you don't you won't have to divide the the, the area in uh, in pieces, but but it becomes an integral just if you wonder. Okay, let's try to answer this. So here they're just asking you to find the flux the flux through the side C. So just the flux through that side here. So which answer is that? S, A, B, C, or D? Uh, C, yes, C. Is that clear? Just over this one. Okay, if, if you do over the whole thing, it's going to be zero. But here, just over that one, that's going to be the answer. Okay? So again, how do we get to the... Gauss uh, equation here is just that you you might have to add here. So you have to add and, and divide all the area is in small unit area and you add them up and then you get the uh, integral which is which means sum. That here it means that it's a closed area. So it means if you find the number of lines going through an imaginary closed area, it's going to be equals to 
Q win over epsilon zero. So it's impressive, but it's not it's not hard. Okay, so blah blah blah. Okay, so here you have a spherical surface. So what do you think of that? So you have an imaginary surface, right? With a, maybe electric field going through, and you know the flux. If you add another charge outside, so if you have a, a charge outside here, you add a charge. Do you think the flux is going to change? Very good, because it only depends on the charge inside. So nature knows that it has to make Gaussian law true. So it will rearrange itself such as the flux through that closed area only depends on whatever is inside. Example, you have all kinds of charges here. If I take an imaginary bag here, can you find the flux? So here, what's going to be the flux here? So I don't know the area, okay? I don't care. I just want to find the flux of the electric field through that imaginary bag. Uh, you write? So one microcoulomb over epsilon zero, which means 10 to the negative six over 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12, which is uh, 10 to the six divided by 8.85 Newton, uh, there was a coulomb here, meter square and you have to divide 1 million by 8.85 so it's about 100,000 just just rounding is that clear this this area here does not exist looks like a brain to me but i'm just applying the math yes What? Option E, option, where is option E? Here. Okay, so what's going to be the flux in that case? Zero, very good. Zero. What does it mean? I don't know how the electric field, it's very hard to see what it looks like, but I know that you're going to have as many lines coming in that you have coming out but we don't know exactly how it's uh, the, the geometry but we can still find the flux zero yes so here the flux equals zero yes here the electric field the the flux is negative so it means it's going in here it's coming out so the flux here for example will be 2 times 10 to the negative 6 over epsilon 0 newton micros. Is that clear? So interestingly, the flux here does not care about the outside world. It's doing its own thing. Okay, so let's apply again So when it's blue, it's the imaginary bag. What, what you really have here, it's like a globe of a Van Graaff generator, right? So it's like, a, a, they call that a shell. Imagine a, a Van Graaff generator, and it's a positively charged on the outside. So I want to know, What's going to be the electric field inside? 
So I can take an imaginary bag inside. So that will be here. Um, the size will be between zero and R. So that's the size of my shell. So what's going to be the flux through that imaginary bag? Huh? Do you have any charge inside? No. So what's going to be the flux? Zero. So inside the conductor, the electric field is always zero. So that's it's called it's called the. See, I didn't change since kindergarten. That's how I learned to make car, and I still do it this way. Uh, it's called a Faraday cage. That means if you are struck by lightning, you're gonna have charge all over the chassis of the car, but inside you're gonna be safe. Okay, because inside the conductor, it doesn't matter if it's a solid conductor or if it's just a shell, E, E equals zero because inside there is no charge. So the electric field is always zero inside the conductor, whether it's a shell or whether it's a solid conductor. That's called a Faraday cage. Now, as you are away, so here you, have, you take your imaginary sphere here, right? It's, it's a bag. Then you're going to have 4 pi r squared, so you are at a distance r. The electric field will be the same all over because of the symmetry equals whatever is inside, so that will be the charge on your Van Graaff generator over epsilon zero. So from the outside, everything happens like you just have a point charge, okay? So at a distance r from a conductor, if you are on the outside, then you, you have electric field equals q in over 4 pi r square epsilon 0. Okay? So you can take your bag here. You have to take advantage of the symmetry because the electric field will be always perpendicular to the surface here. Because nature cannot choose if it's uniformly charged here and the charge will move as far as they can from each other. It has to be the same here at that distance that here. Is that clear? So here you do the math. Conclusion, outside the shell, the electric field is whatever is inside. So that will be the Q, the, the charge on the Van Graaff generator. Usually it's nano-coulomb. Van Graaff generator has a very high voltage, 5,000 volt, 100,000 volt, but the charge on it is very small. It's like nanocoulomb, so it's not going to kill you. So anyway, the charge all over the Van Graaff generator here over 4 pi r square epsilon zero. Inside here, the electric field equals zero. Okay, so if you have a spherical shell, but you are at a distance farther away from the shell, so at a distance r, what's, what's going to happen to the electric field? 1 over r squared, very good. So because you are an uh, engineer, if you want to find, make a graph E as a function of r, try, try to trace what it looks like. When it's smaller than R, electric field is zero, and then boom, it goes as one over R square. But inside the shell, the electric field is zero. Okay? Now, it doesn't have to be a shell. It could be a solid sphere as long as it's a conductor. Nature will arrange 
such as all the charges will move on the outside. And I don't know if you remember the um, uh, the app. I don't want to, to go back to that, but do you remember uh, Havolta? And if you, that's also from kindergarten, okay? I didn't, still didn't evolve. If you rub your feet against the carpet, right, for friction, you're going to transfer electrons from the carpet here to your body. But those electrons don't move inside your body, okay? They will stay on the outside. They will stay on the outside, right? If, if you are uh, you are a conductor because you are made of fluid, calcium, potassium, sodium, whatever. And if you, if you touch a, a doorknob, for example, here, which is uh, made of metal, all those little minus going to go here. It's going to leave your body. But my point is that the charge, even when talking about the human body, they always move on the outside. Okay. So I have a short movie for you. Let's see. Uh, Gauss, where am I? Building. It's called hands is neutralized by mobile and constantly moving electrons. Passing through a conductor forces the electrons on to flow until, until they pile they up pile at the surface, up. repelling the motion of further electrons. But that means the electric field inside in a conductor becomes equal to zero when electrostatic equilibrium is established. Therefore, a closed surface inside the conductor has no flux through it. So the net charge inside must be zero. But there can be a charge on the surface, and no matter what's outside, the surface charge makes the field inside equal to zero. And since all the actions at the surface, a metal box of any sort, even a flimsy screen-covered gauge, can keep out an electric field. That fact can be demonstrated with this device, a gold leaf electroscope. Notice how it responds to the field of an electric charge. Notice too, that even when an electroscope is inside the cage, it reacts in the same fashion. However, when the box is enclosed, an electric field can enter to disturb the gold leaf. Any metal box can do it. And to this day, any metal box that does do it is called a Faraday cage. Of course, not every Faraday cage was designed to protect its contents. Okay, so that's why if you go for a tunnel, then you won't get signal, right? Because a tunnel has a frame, a metallic frame, so it will uh, shield you from the outside electromagnetic wave. You know how people, when they don't want to be found, for example, they take their phone and they will put aluminum all around, that's called the Faraday cage. So it's actually a consequence of Coulomb's law. So for example, if you have a shell, right, and the shell is positively charged, for example, or, or negatively charged, but so it's it's a, it's charged, so one point of generator. Of course, at that point, you're going to have an electric field, but the elect net electric field is going to be zero. And that's a consequence of inverse square law. 
At that point P, you're going to have an electric field from that area, but it's a small area and that distance is strong, I mean large, right? Then you have an electric field from this area, which is larger, but the distance is smaller. The distance here, the, the electric field depends on R square, and the area depends on R square. The distance is R square, the area is R square. So at that point, it does not mean that you don't have individual electric field, but the net electric field equals zero. So it's a, co uh, it's a consequence of inverse square law. So inside the shell, the electric field is zero, always. Inside the conductor, it doesn't matter if it's solid or if it's just um, a shell, it's always equals to zero. So you have all those experiments. Um, fun, if you go to Boston Museum, they have those huge Van Graaff generator that was used back then to accelerate particles, particle accelerator, and someone is standing here, and that person will be safe because it's a Faraday cage. No electric field can be a low inside. Electric field is what makes move the charge. Moving charge is current, current is what keeps you. So no electric field, no current, no death. Okay, um, that's why if you have cable, like if you take a USB cable, for example, a cheap one, uh, you, cut, you cut that, can cut, and look inside, you're gonna have a shielding here. So that shielding is to shield whatever is inside the signal uh, from from the outside. So thanks to a Faraday cage or a shielding, the, the whatever is inside doesn't care about the outside, or the outside doesn't care about the inside. So it's called shielding. That makes that invention such a smart setup. You see that the charge here I brought on the rubber, it's like a rubber belt, up here, here you have friction. Because of the friction, you're going to split charge into negative and positive. Positive charge is going to go up. Here you have a brush. So what the charge is going to do, they know Gauss law. So they know they cannot stay inside. They know that they have to find a way to the outside. And they're going to go on the outside here. And they're going to build up. That's how a Van Graaff can get a lot of charge relatively. Relative. It's like nano coulomb here. And you keep keep building up on the outside. There, there is a maximum of charge you can get, right? Because it depends on the geometry. So what you are what you have here is called a capacitor. You have plus on one side, you have minus on the other side, and you can discharge it. Okay, so here that was from the movie. You see that electric field lines have to start from plus, but they have to end on minus. So if you have one, two, three, four, five, six starting lines here, you know you need to have one, two, three, four, five, six ending lines here. Always from plus to minus, from plus to minus. So what you have here is called a polarization. Inside, the charges will arrange themselves such as inside there is no electric field line. Okay, you see also that the lines are always perpendicular to the surface, always perpendicular. So that's how it works. Interestingly, uh, you see here that uh, it's uniformly distributed. But charges, they love corner. Sharp corner, you're going to have more charge here, but the, the lines are always perpendicular. Okay, so when you shock someone, if there was a spark, it's always from your finger because you're going to have more charge accumulating here at the tip of your finger, right? Okay, so that's an interesting uh, configuration. 
So how does that work? You have a shell, okay? So here it's just a shell and here you have plus Q. What's going on here? If, if you take an imaginary bag, which is called the Gaussian, what's going to be the electric field? You already know that inside the conductor, the electric field is zero, okay? So I know that inside here, it's going to be zero. You can only have charges on the outside. So it could be here and it could be there. But remember that Gauss law says that the flux equals Q in over epsilon zero. And the flux equals zero. That means that the total charge, the total charge here inside that bag has to be zero. So the only way to achieve that is to understand that you're gonna have polarization. So on inside here, you're gonna have minus Q. And because you didn't have charge to begin with, so here you don't have plus Q. So that's how it works. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna take example so then you understand how it works. What's in, interesting about um, Faraday cage is that the outside world does not care what's going on inside the shield. So if you have coaxial cable, it's gonna be shielded like by aluminum and the outside world doesn't care what's going on inside and the inside world does not care what's going on outside. So let, let's take to do this one. So it's a, no, this one because it has, it's, it's a bit challenging, but uh, once you know how to do it, it's not that bad. So before reaching static equilibrium, we have a shell. I don't know where is my mouse. Okay, so we have a, maybe it's a conductor. It is, it's both a conductor, but here you have a shell. And inside here you have a sphere. Doesn't matter if it's a hollow or solid. And it's charged by negative 50 E. E is the charge of an electron, right? Not that we care, but... And this is charged with minus 100. Let's try just to ask our goods, okay? So let's say, that means here you have negative 50, yes? So negative 50, it's very upset here because um, here you have negative 100. So on the other side here, how much do you think it's gonna, what's gonna happen here? Plus 50, very good. Just ask your gut, right? It's gonna be plus 50. Why is that? Because remember uh, here, we go back to here. You see wh whatever number of lines here, the part has to end up on the same amount of charge on that conductor here. Same number of lines from plus have to end up on, on the minus. So here I need to have, here, it's gonna be plus 50. Okay, so here it's, uh, you, you can have an electric field, right? So it's gonna be from plus, I'm gonna have an electric field from, so here anyway, that's gonna be plus 50, yes? So what, how much do we have on the outside? Yeah, so before, before we have minus 100, now we have plus 50 here. So on the outside, 
So it's gonna be um, minus minus one minus one fifty minus one fifty. Is, is that clear? Because whatever you start with, you need to end up with. Okay, so it's like it's polarized. Minus 50, 50, minus 150 on the outside. Now the outside world just care about, you know, the total charge inside. Okay, so for the outside, whatever is inside is mi minus 150. So the electric field here is going to go be in, and it's going to be Q in over 4 pi epsilon 0 r square. That will be the electric field outside. And how much is in? It's going to be your minus 50 coulomb in, inside. Do I have minus 150 coulomb? No, minus 50 coulomb. Yes, inside. No. Uh, I forgot. So outside, from outside, how much you have? Minus 150. Okay, so what is the charge? In the shell inner surface, that's going to be 50 here, and outside is going to be minus 150. Okay, now let's take let's take this this example. You talk to each other. So give you some time. So here you have Q minus 2Q, that will be minus Q. So have Q here. So Q here, this is empty. So Q is positive. So I have plus, 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 plus. So here you need to have minus. So how much do I have here? Because you have Q. So here you need to have minus q because you need to have as many lines to start with that you have to end up okay so each of these plus has to end up on the minus because that's the rule with electric field line they start with a plus they end up on the minus so you cannot leave one behind okay so you need as many plus q that you have minus q here is that clear? Okay, so now we have a problem because before here you have minus 2q and minus q has migrated on, on the inside and charge is conserved. Okay, so whatever you had to begin with, you need to have to end up with. So that's before minus q here so here we're gonna have um, three is that three What did you say? So 
So I had minus 2q to begin with, and minus q is gone here. So how much is left? Minus q, surprisingly. So here it's going to have minus q. on the outside so here you have minus q so minus q minus q which makes minus 2q and minus q and q here is that clear so here so here you always have zero here here it's always zero and the only way to make it zero if you take a Gaussian surface is to have minus q here because minus q plus q is zero. So that way we are sure that here it's going to be zero. Okay? Now if you take the Gaussian surface on the outside, so if I take that back here, if, if you take a Gaussian surface here, right? And you apply, you apply the flux equals Q in over epsilon zero. What is Q inside? Negative Q over epsilon zero. So E times four pi r square equals whatever is inside in magnitude. Okay, let's forget about the minus on the outside. So the electric field is in and it doesn't care what's, whatever is going on inside. So you do it in two steps. You want to make sure that all the plus end up on the minus or all the minus end up on the plus and to find the outside, you use conservation of charge. Yeah, I have another example. Okay, let's take this example again. Okay, so what does it say? This one is Q1, and this is minus 3Q1. That's what you start with. Okay, so inside here, there is no electric field, and here it's plus, 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 plus. So it's plus Q1. So you know that it has to end up on minus, right? Each one of them. So if you have Q1 here, you, you're going to have what here? Negative Q. So here you have on the inside minus uh, Q1. Yes? And then what do we have on the outside? We know that before we have minus 3q1 equals minus q1 so we're missing what minus q1 so here is going to be minus 2q1 is that clear So in, if, if you take the Gaussian surface here, you see that Q in is going to be minus Q1 and then uh, plus Q1. So that's going to be Q in, which is minus 2Q1. So the electric field outside times the area for pi r square equals 2Q1 over epsilon zero outside. 
so it doesn't care from the outside it doesn't care you know how they arrange themselves it doesn't get involved you know do your own business i don't care what i care about is that if you take a gaussian surface what i care is whatever is in the bag and what is in the bag minus q1 plus q1 is that clear so that's the idea of a coaxial cable outside wall does not get involved with the signal inside so it's shielded any question so i refer to the book okay if it's not clear you're gonna find example in the book but here you have an example here again so what what does it say here so you have a plus q a uh, uh, plus two micro so this is a shell so that's a shell here so plus two so here you have you need to have minus two q on the outside and here you have three micro so three minus two is one that's what it says here is that clear or do i have to do it it's good so the, the 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 principle is this if you have plus here it has to end up on the minus and the number of pluses needs to be equal to to the number of minuses but the total charge that you had before has to be equal to the total charge you end up with okay if, if you need uh, it, it just just in two steps first step you're going to do the same amount of charge here that you have here except it's opposite and then second step whatever you began with with the total of charge you need to end up with but the charge will always rearrange themselves in such a way that the electric field inside the conductor equals to zero and it's called shielding Okay, so so this one is uh, more challenging, let's think. Um, so here you have a solid sphere. And it says you have a charge inside uniformly distributed. So how is that possible? Can you have that if it's a conductor? No, so it's an insulator. So with insulator, if you do uh, engineering like material or uh, you work on material, you, you can have a charged uh, insulator. So here you have charge inside uniformly distributed. So first of all, if, if you are on the outside, outside world, do you agree that the electric field will go down as one over r square right everything happens you just have one big charge q and you apply coulomb's law or you apply gauss's law so if you take like a surface area you know all around you're going to say that the flux e times the area equals q in over epsilon zero do you agree with that? So let's let's try. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, it's like the, the same thing with, with gravity, right? Like a, a body of mass. Yes. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. So it's it's like you have a planet, and if you go at the center of the planet, gravity is gonna be zero. Right? It only depends whatever is inside. So if you make a tunnel, it's a planet, you make a tunnel here. Here you're not going to feel any force. Here you're going to feel a large force depending on all the mass there. And here the force of gravity will only depend on that volume there. I remember from last semester, if you fall, you're going to oscillate back and forth. Uh, but, but let's go back to here so apply 
apply Gauss's law on the outside. So now you are at a distance r, r is larger than the radius a. And again, imagine it's a plastic, it's, it's, a, it's a sphere, a solid sphere, but made of plastic. So you can charge it inside. It's like you can take a, some kind of shot here and charge inside that sphere here. So now you apply Gauss's law and you say the flux, so the electric flux, okay, so electric field will be always perpendicular, always the same because of the symmetry. So flux of the electric field through that imaginary bag equals whatever is inside over epsilon zero. So flux is the electric field times the area equals Q in over epsilon zero. So the electric field will be, which we already knew, four pi r square epsilon zero. Is that clear? So if you are at a distance larger than the radius, everything happens like you have a point charge here located there, and the dependence is in one over r square. Because the electric field here on that area only depends on whatever is inside the bike. So far, so good. So now what's going to happen if I have a distance smaller than the radius? So I am inside that. So you have different way to do it. Can you discuss? So now I am here. I want to find out what's going to be the electric field here at that distance. So first of all, because of the symmetry, would you agree with me that the electric field will be the same all over that area here at a distance r? Because nature will not know how to differentiate that point here from that point here. Because of the symmetry, you expect the electric field here to be in this direction, perpendicular. And then you take an imaginary bag. Do you see that imaginary bag here? So try to apply Gauss law. What is given to you, given, is that you have the radius, okay? And you have the whole charge here. So you have different way to do it, but try to do it. It's a, it's a volume, right? So you can say charge divided by volume equals the density. That's one way to do it. And it's a constant density throughout the sphere because it's uniformly distributed in 3D. Okay, so charge divided by volume. So the total charge divided by the total volume equals the density. Call that rho. Or we can say that a small dq over a small volume is also equal to the density. And it's solid, right? So try to do it. And, and you are right, you have the same problem with a planet. It's the same thing. That's Newton who figured this out. Okay, just apply Gaussian. The, the, the Gauss's law, Q in over epsilon zero. Okay, step by step. What's the flux? It's going to be E. So I'm taking an imaginary bag. So E times the area, that area here, the radius is R equals Q in, so inside that bag, okay, 
inside that bag, only inside that bag, right? And the whole thing is Q, Q total, I'm going to say. So you have two ways to do it. If you understand geometry, you can say that Q in is to Q what R Q is to A. So that's uh, engineering thinking. Q in is to total Q what R Q is to A Q. But you don't have to do that. That that will be a shortcut. Otherwise, you go step by step. So E times the area. What's the area of a sphere? Four pi r r square. Right? Area is square. Volume is cube. Okay equals q in so either you take the shortcut here or you can say the charge is the density times the volume that's the volume so 4 over 3 pi r cube over epsilon 0 Yes, but well, that's the long way. Short way will be this. Yes, are you with me? And and then uh, physics stops and and boring math takes over because the density is the total charge divided by the total volume. That's going to be four over three pi. A Q uh sorry density is I want ahead of myself so the charge that's given over four over three pi a q so you can plug that into here and at the end what you get you get the dependence in R. You want me to do it or it's just, huh? It's easier if you use that equation here, but I, I don't know if you understand this. It's not too hard. Okay, so here, so E times four pi R square equals the density. So what is the density is Q over four over three pi a cube times four over three pi r cube divided by epsilon zero so that's a lot of bye bye so bye bye and then bye bye okay and you have a cube here and a square there so you're gonna have e equals q r and then four pi epsilon zero and then here you have a to the third so check four times the area so we are talking about this area so four pi r square equals q in over epsilon zero q in is the density so it's q over four over three pi a q over epsilon zero because you have this one yes so my point is really that the electric field is side is proportional to r okay so it's not going to be in the test to do those computations but it's going to be in the assignment just to understand that E will increase linearly with the distance and then it's going to be decrease 1 over R square. The, the, the goal here is to practice um, engineering skill, okay, just 
to do, even if you're doing chemistry, you have very complex problem using density that you have to deal with. So it's a good practice. Okay, is that clear? Okay, if you need help, you come see me after and I'll divide everything. Oh, okay, everything is broken up here. Now you will have, you, you can have a shortcut if you say that Q in, so the charge inside that small volume is to the total charge what R cube is to A cube. I'm missing a cube here. Okay, it's, it's the ratio between the volume is the same as the ratio between the charges, right? So the charge inside the small volume, so the charge inside that small volume is to the charge inside the big volume, what the small volume is to the big volume. That's what it means. Does it make sense? Hi. Okay, just for math. But let's, let's apply also Gaussian law here. Let's say you want to find the electric field at the distance R from a wire, right? So you have a wire, which is a, a line, which is positively charged. And the goal for you is to find the electric field line at a distance R from the wire using Gaussian law. Okay, can you do that? So you have a wire and the goal is to find the electric field at a distance R from the wire using the symmetry. So you can help each other, talk to each other. It's called the linear symmetry. So that surface here doesn't exist. That you have to come up with it. But it's a long wire which is charged. And because of the symmetry, you see that at that distance here, first of all, electric field will be the same all around, okay? Because of the symmetry, it's a very, very long wire. You, you, you can, that, that distance here is L. And also E is perpendicular. Because of the symmetry, nature doesn't know how to choose from that angle to this angle, so it's gonna be perpendicular. So all you have to do is to apply Gauss's law. So the flux of the electric field, so the number of lines going through that cylinder equals Q in over epsilon zero. So Q in. And you have also the Q equals the density times the length, right? That's a linear density. So Q in, Q in, it's gonna be your density. Density is given times the length. Is that clear? So what is given? Given you have R and lambda. Okay, so now you can do it. So Q in, equals lambda times length, and that's my my area. And, and by the way, this is a cylinder, okay? You see? And if I open it, if I want to find the area, I get a rectangle, right? And the rectangle is the height times the width. But the width here is just 2 pi r. Do you understand? 
So if you have a cylinder and you want to find the surface area, you open it here. So you're going to have the height times 2 pi r. Okay, just in case you forget. Okay, so E times the area. So that area here, there is no E here. So I'm not going to take into account that area here. I could, but there is no E coming out, and there is no E coming out from the, the bottom, even if it's a closed area. E is always coming out from there, from the outside, e equals Q in over epsilon zero. So E times, so what is the area? You take a whole paper toilet hole here, okay? So it's going to be this, so 2 pi r times the height, so times L equals whatever is inside, so it's going to be lambda times L over epsilon zero. Cross that out, so we have the electric field at a distance R from the wire equals lambda over 2 pi R epsilon zero. And that's how we use Gauss law which is nice because now you don't have to, you remember how we used to do it? You have to take a point here, P, and you have to take a DQ here, and you have to take, you know, that from here, from there, that's from the homework, and it's, it was a lot of computation. Using Gauss law, you skip all those computations, you get straight to the answer. Is that clear? Now, you can apply, you can, you should do that for uh, next uh, Thursday. You can apply the same idea, same idea, to find to find the electric field. Do you remember that um, uh, equation? Uh, uh, it's lambda uh, sigma or lambda, no sigma over two epsilon zero. Do you remember that um, I show you a video where? The professor took a very, very large area made of aluminium, and he found that the electric field, if you are not too far away, it's going to be the same. It does not depend on the distance. And I told you that the electric field is the density divided by 2 epsilon 0. Do you remember that? And a, a disk is the same. So when you take a flat conductor, like a piece of aluminum or a disk, if you are at a distance small relative to the size of your aluminum paper or sheet, the electric field is a constant and it's going to be the density, the charge density divided by 2 epsilon zero. You remember that? And uh, that's why when we talk about the capacitor, if this is plus, 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 and this is minus, 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 we were able to show that the electric field inside is epsilon over epsilon, uh, uh, sigma over epsilon zero. Do you remember I show you that? But this I didn't explain why. I mean, we, we did the, the computation for the disk, and we were able to show that if you are very close to the disk, it was a charged disk. Do you remember that? We, we did find the equation for the charged disk along the axis, and we found that if we are very close to the disk, the electric field equals the charge density over 2 epsilon 0. We did that uh, with a 2 here, yes? Remember that we did that last week. So anyway, you, you can use Gauss law to show it in a different way. So try to do that for uh, for first day. Okay.